I've been looking for things to sell as we set up the retail side of the store. I want to find people to display and sell their artwork, but I'm also just a fan of collectibles. I mean, old toys, action figures, things like that. It's, it's fun going back and finding collectibles and interesting toys and weird items. It's been a while since I've done that, and I've never really done it at this scale before. I've started going to estate sales and vintage flea markets and trying to curate stuff that I just think is neat, for lack of a better way of putting it. So I try out things that I think are cool and then test out selling them online and I see what works and what gets the most hits and then try and find more of that. The reason that I'm doing that as well is the stuff I'm getting specifically inspires me and I'm also thinking of creating my own things based on what people seem to like. Maybe create things in a similar style or even try to see what I could create out of these items as artwork that people may want. So that's the new way that I'm going to try and expand on what I'm creating I think my own little pop culture museum of things to draw. I'm Tom Ray, and this is American Bandito. I would still like to get back into doing animation again, and that's why I was very pleasantly surprised when I did my call up for artists on the mailing list and the person I meet today responded to me. My name's John Sanford, and I'm an animation director, story artist, and writer, and a sometime webcomics cartoonist. So when John first contacted me, I was excited to hear from someone that was an animation director, and of course, I wanted to hear more about that and about the webcomic he's doing, which is called Chippy and Lupus. First of all, tell me where you're from. From Denver, Colorado. Is that where you're living right now? No, I'm in uh, Burbank, California right now. Okay. Oh, where the animation is done. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> How did you get started? How long have you been uh, drawing and doing animation? Uh, drawing has been, let's see. Well, I, it's that old story where you, I've, I've been drawing since I could like hold a pencil. But I became seriously obsessed with cartooning when I was about, let's see, 11 years old. My mom bought my brother and I a book called uh, The Art of Professional Cartooning by, uh, and it was by this guy, he was an advertising cartoonist and he was fam He was most famous for doing, uh, for what, being one of the guys who directed a bunch of the Schoolhouse Rock things. Oh, okay. And showed how to just do very simple figures, break down the characters into shapes, but it also described Cartooning is something that you can make a living from. You know, you just, he described there's car, you know there's comic strips, there's animation. It just broke down the various professions, and I I read this book, I did all the lessons, and I just decided that's what I want to do. This sounds really good. After that, it became an obsession, and to the point where it probably made my parents really irritated. I decided to just just do that and I tried to do comic strips and then around about 1988 I saw uh, Who Framed Roger Rabbit and thought oh animation I want to do animation so I uh, put together a portfolio I went to I was going to one art school for um, just advertising and stuff like that just learning how to draw and I found out about Cal Arts California Institute of the Arts from an article in a magazine called Comic Scene about Glenn Keane, and he mentioned Cal Arts as the place he went to school. So I thought, oh, I'll try and get in there. And I, I submitted a portfolio. I got in, went to Cal Arts for three years, and at, after that, I went to Disney Feature Animation. What was the type of stuff that you were putting in your portfolio? So I guess if you were going to get into a school like that, like you went to Cal Arts and you're like, here's my uh, portfolio. I mean, what what were you showing them? Or what do you think is, what type of things would you need to actually get into a school like that as far as a portfolio? Oh, that's, uh, let's see, stuff like um, whatever life drawings I had from the school I went to previous. They wanted to see life drawings. They wanted to see personal work. The stuff I think that made them think that I could maybe do it is I, I filled like a sketchbook with just figure studies and I went out and drew people in action. I drew my dogs a lot in action. I drew, I had a cat. I, I did, there was a bunch of sketches of the cat. It basically drawings that told them, oh, he's interested in, in motion, in figures and how they work. And, and I also put in a, a sketchbook of just cartoon stuff, like stuff I was trying to figure out, like stories. And so and by cartoon stuff, you mean more like comic strip or actual like animated cartoon stuff? Um, a little of both stuff, stuff where I was trying to figure out how to draw 
animated cartoon stuff. So I, I think it was stuff that just showed them, oh, he's got some imagination. He's got kind of a quirky sense of humor. He's also trying to figure out how motion works, stuff like that. And that's that's the type of stuff I had in, the, had in my portfolio, and that kind of helped me. I think that's what helped me get in. Shortly after I got into the school and I'd been – doing it for a while i looked at the stuff i said and i was like i can't believe they let me in because it was really bad <laughs> well and on top of that you were saying that uh, right after that you w went to work for walt disney so did they just yeah they showed up at the school one day and they went you you and you or i mean you clearly had to apply at walt disney i'm assuming so you'd been there for how long and then how did you get the job at walt disney i was at Callers for three years i did two films and that's First year, everybody does a min, uh, like a, a film that's like a minute long, oh. and I got that got that done. Second year, and this happens to a lot of students, I got really ambitious and I tried a really much longer, more elaborate film, didn't finish. Uh, third year, I reeled it back in, did a shorter, simpler film, actually more or less got it done. Every year, everybody does their films. And the teachers choose like maybe an hour's worth of films. So they choose maybe 20, 30 films mm -hmm. from the student body. And that they call that the producer show. All the studios come up and watch the films and kind of like go, okay, you, you, you. Oh, they, they did do it that way then. <laughs> yeah, basically. Yeah. So what happens is, is so Disney's there. Like this is 1993. So it was Disney and a bunch of like, I think the, the folks who like film Roman that does the Simpsons nowadays, it's, it's Disney, it's Netflix, it's DreamWorks, it's Pixar. At the time it was Disney and Pixar and a bunch of other people. The folks at Disney saw my, saw my film and thought, Oh, he has a interesting way to approach the story. He's funny. He can, he can obviously do this. Let's, let's uh, try him out as story artist. So they hired me as a, a story trainee, a story artist trainee. So doing storyboards and, or actual scripts? Well, the way it works is it's storyboards, but they also hire you for your ability to potentially write. At the time story was done at Disney, they'd, they'd had, they had script writers, but a lot of times what they do is we just talk the script and just go from outline and okay. make it up. What was the film that you did? What, or what was it like? It was a little boy and he's, I established very early at the, at the front of the film that he's got a problem telling the truth and an alien ship comes down and the alien comes out and it's and when the alien is revealed you see him in silhouette he approaches the house when he bursts into the house he's revealed to be elvis the big overweight elvis elvis wrecks the house and then leaves and when his mom comes in she's like what the hell happened here mm -hmm. and none of your lives young man or you're gonna be in big trouble and i fade to black as the kid's going uh, uh um, <laughs> basically that's and that's the film john started so early on in animation that it occurred to me i was in a interesting situation here i was talking to someone that did this by hand when he started no programs or digital ink and paint i've only ever met people that created cartoons on computers i'm, I'm assuming now you probably work more digitally so what was your first transition into doing digital animation i didn't start working digitally until 2005 oh wow that's when this that's uh they first brought in Cintiqs at so I was working at Sony Feature Animation. I saw my first Cintiq when my friend. So Cintiq, you're talking about the one where you draw directly on the screen and you can like, right. like yeah, okay. The um, tablets, let's see, the um, Wacom tablets existed, but it was the one of those things where you were drawing over here and looking up there. Yeah, you either got it or you didn't. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And I was one of those guys who didn't. So. When they introduced the Cintiq at Sony, uh, they started bringing them in at Disney. That's when I got into it. They find like Sony, like just one day said, okay, everybody's going to start working digitally. And they just handed out Cintiqs. They brought in Cintiqs. Everybody got a computer. Everybody got a Cintiq. They were given Photoshop mm -hmm. and they said, okay, go. And what was interesting is back then the idea was you would draw digitally and then everybody was going to print it out and still pin it up to storyboards. I was going to say, because Photoshop yeah. isn't going to solve that problem for you. <laughs> it's not. Well, it's you can pitch like the next place I worked, which was Pixar. Pixar had it all figured out. They were like, OK, here's what you do. You draw in Photoshop and then we've got this program that will collect all your drawings so that you can flip through them and you can pitch them that way. And it's a it's a program they call Pitch Doctor. And what that that program not only um, 
you can time the drawings, you can add sound, and then you can package them up and it sends them to editorial so that they can take it into the um, AVID, which is the editorial program. Then the editor can tie, you know, time them properly and put sound effects and all that stuff. Pixar was the first place to figure that out. Everybody else, after I worked at Pixar, I worked at DreamWorks, and DreamWorks, you just used Adobe Bridge hmm. to number and, and pitch through everything. Really? Because you can number and everything. The problem, it's not perfect. It works. And then later on, DreamWorks started using a program called Flix, which was um, invented by a guy at a, that worked at a place called The Foundry. And it does almost exactly what Pitch Doctor does. So I don't know whether he saw Pitch Doctor and right. or whether he just said, well, this is these are the needs where everybody's boarding digitally. They're all using Photoshop. We need a thing that collects the drawings, can number them instantly, can keep track of them. Now pretty much everybody either uses Flix or I think force everybody to use Storyboard Pro. Okay, I realize we started geeking out over animating programs there, but to me that evolution was fascinating. I think we then went into like a 10 minute conversation about animating programs like Toon Boom and Flash, which is bad for the internet these days, but it's still a great program for making 2D animation, in my personal opinion. That's when he told me that he worked on the new version of the cartoon Peabody and Sherman using Flash. The New Adventures of Peabody and Sherman, the show I worked for, I was a director on that at DreamWorks. Oh, cool. That was animated entirely in Flash. I wondered that. I saw some of yeah. that, and I was like, this looks kind of Flash-like. Okay. It's Flash. It's all Flash. The guys who did that were like just wizards at pushing Flash and using it to, to its to its greatest extent and they didn't see any need to use harmony or anything like that like, okay flash works and this is why i thought that it looked like flash because when i first got flash and i got into it people didn't know how to secure the animations that they put up on the internet so what you could do is you right. could download the sws file and then upload that to your uh your flash program and actually take a look at how they drew it and oh, I, wow. was able, I, I was able, I was, yeah, I was able to study. And one of the people that I studied was, oh, I forget his last name now. He runs Renegade Animation. I know Renegade, uh, that's Daryl Van Sitter's company. Oh, that's I what I meant who, to say. Daryl Van Sitter's. Yeah. He did a web ca uh, cartoon called Elmo Aardvark, oh. Outer Space oh, yeah. Detective. And that was one of the ones I downloaded. And that's how I, basically I was studying all these other things. And most of them were very much like, let's get this done. This is how we do it. And they were all kind of yeah. done the same way. His was done classic style. His was done like you could tell that it was timed. It was drawn by hand. Like there were, yeah. yeah, there were things where when you downloaded it and you saw the actual drawings, it was like they would draw where the end of the screen was and it would overlap like the line marks would go over it. You would be able to see off screen the actual holes in the paper because they photocopied it. They were drawn by hand and yeah. scanned in. So I was like, holy crap. So I did, I, when I realized that, I'm like, oh my God, I can draw this by hand and scan it into Flash and do it that way. Yeah, like Daryl is such a smart guy that he probably looked at it and realized, wait a minute, we can just use this the same way that we you use limited animation. Yeah, so he was one of the pioneers. I know, and I might be wrong about this, John, John Chris Belushi likes to take credit for pushing Flash. But there was also a company, and a few of my friends worked there, called Icebox that really pushed it. They did Dr. Wong, really or Mr. Wong, it. and they did. Uh, they had a poker night, which was with the guys from Mystery Science Theater 3000. They were talking right. dogs. And right, right. Yeah, stuff like that. See, I told yeah. you I paid attention during that time. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. I was, like, I was fascinated during that time, and I had a friend, I had a friend at Disney who taught himself how to use it, just, just opened it up, and he made all sorts of crazy animated cartoons. It, it's such an interesting program. You can you can use it almost any way you want. Yeah. A lot of those guys just pushed it to the to this extreme. Then you, then there's the home star runner guys who use it that way. Right. I, I think people are still using it. Right. Yeah. It's. Are I they? mean, it's basically it's good for in betweens, if anything. Again, we could nerd out over cartoons all day, but I also wanted to know about his web comic, Chippy and Lupus. Clearly, he keeps busy by making animations. So why did he start a web comic? You did say when we started out that. You're occasionally a webcomic artist. So why do you do it if it's only occasionally? I started it completely by accident. Cause <laughs> okay. I was working at Sony in 2005. We were still working on paper. And one of the things about storyboards back then is they'd have, you'd pin up the storyboard and then there'd be a little strip of dialogue underneath, right? And that was about, that was a two inch by eight inch strip. And sometimes one of us would get bored in a meeting and take a strip and just start drawing on the strip. A friend of mine named Jeff Ranjo, he, he just drew a bunch of boxes on one. 
just at random, just drew a bunch of boxes, and then he just started filling them with imagery. And by the end, he had a, a strange, quirky little comic strip. And this was back when blogs were huge, and we all had a blog called Storyboardum, and he just put it up on the <laughs> blog. And I looked at that, and I said, wow, that's really cool. I wonder if I could do that. And so I took out a two-by-eight strip, and I made little boxes. And in the first panel, I drew a little rabbit and a little wolf thing, kind of improv the dialogue. And by the end, I actually had a joke. I showed it to a friend that had just kind of blundered into the blundered into the room to tell me about a meeting. And I said, hey, what do you think of this? And he read it. He said, that's hilarious. You should put it up on the blog. And so I did. Mm -hmm. And so for a while, Jeff and, Jeff and I were like kind of doing it. We're like, we're going to see if we could do one a day per year. He gave up and I kept going. And so what I, what I wound up doing is turning my little, and they were just scribbly little drawings. And I was just doing it kind of as an improv exercise, but I discovered that like by doing it, I discovered characters. The rabbit became a little guy named Chippy. The wolf guy became a dude, a really dumb idiot guy named Lupus. Mm -hmm. And from there, I developed stories and eventually turned it into a webcomic. I, I eventually got a site. I did it for a few years. I did it off and on for a few years. And recently I started writing strips again and I'm going to eventually put, put them up, but I got kind of got sidetracked because a friend of mine recently, I think it was on another podcast and they said, Hey, have you ever thought of making that a TV show? And I said, nobody's going to buy a TV show of that. <laughs> and they're like, uh, no, you should look at what going on in animation you, you should be more aware of your industry so i took a look around and i went oh maybe i could so <laughs> i've been developing them into a tv show <laughs> okay oh you have all right yeah so, i have so. and in doing that what is that what does that process entail if you're doing it are you saying you're setting up to pitch to somebody to pay you to do it or are you saying you're doing it and you're going to build it up as something that you could possibly monetize at the moment, I'm building it up as something that would be beyond my capabilities to produce by myself. Okay. Because I looked at the, the the show that I looked at that most closely resembled my strip, strangely, was Rick and Morty. Because and, and it, this is how it started. It's a thing that Justin Roiland did for fun, mm -hmm. and then it turned into, and then they kind of pounded it into a TV show. And it's kind of a vehicle to do whatever kind of story they want. And that's kind of the way the comic strip, my comic strip went is I, because my strip was so improv improvisational, I basically just did whatever was interesting to me at the time. So the characters wound up going through time. I, the characters wound up fighting dinosaurs at one point. They fight, they, they deal with gangsters. So I thought this might make an interesting TV show. Like if you look at the old peanut specials, a lot of those are just strips stuck together. Mm -hmm. like, you, like there's there's one or two of the peanut specials that Schultz just just said, okay, we'll take, you know, this series in the strip, this series of strips, and we'll turn it into a special. Like following that model, I went, okay, if I take this storyline from the strip here to here and then break it down and I just wrote, I basically just transcribed it into, into, a, into the final draft. Showed it to a friend of mine, that a writer friend of mine who worked with me on Peabody and Sherman. I said, what do you think of this? And he said, it's really great. Here's what you need. If you add these things, it'll feel like a TV show. Hmm. And so I added a cold open. I, I just added a couple bits that actually helped it helped clarify it as a TV show. Like if you're coming back from commercial, you have to restate the theme, that sort of thing. So I wound up with a like a 27 minute pilot script and you have, you just write a pitch Bible that just describes the kind of show it's going to be. If you are setting it up to be like that, then what's the process to go about that? Like me, I know how to plop it on the internet and try and promote it. So what's the, right. in the realm that you're doing it, how, how do you try and get someone to back you on that? I looked up my connections and I don't have big, I, I don't have the deepest connections, but I've been around long enough that I somehow knew the guy who was in charge of adult animation at Netflix. <laughs> okay. So, <laughs> that, so that, that is guy, handy. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So that guy, I emailed him and I said, Hey, are you want to hear a pitch? And he said, sure. So I went in and I pitched it to Netflix and they passed. Um, oh, okay. But, um, all right, good. But, Cause right now I was about to say, so this isn't helpful at all. <laughs> <laughs> No, no, no. It, it's interesting because I pitched it. A, I pitched it now three different places, and now I'm in the process of trying to figure out how to refine it, make it, make the pitch better. I've kind of hit the end. I 
hit the end of my connections really quickly. Like, why do you think they passed on it? He said it seemed, it felt like, and you'll hear this every now and then when you're pitching, it feels a lot like a lot of the things we have in, we currently have on in production. Ah, okay. That's a, that's a common thing you'll hear. What I think I failed to do is I failed to convey what it's going to be like as a TV show. And I don't think it was clear what the world of the strip is like from the pitch Bible. Here's the other thing is they kept saying that of the three places I pitched, two of them said, is there a place online I can go and read all these? Mm. And I went, no, because I used to have the, all the strips up online, but I, but the website got hacked. Oh, it I did. Pull it in down. Yeah. So one of the things I'm going to do is make sure there is a place that they can go and read all of them. Like, okay. so, oh yeah, you can go here and read, read the strip, go look at it. The other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to try and just refine the pitch Bible and make it so that it's a little clear what the world is like. And I might try and storyboard bits of the pilot to make it clear that here's how it would look in animation. Yeah. Here's how it would play in animation. This part was also foreign to me as far as pitching an idea. I'm just used to taking an idea that I have and running with it in front of everyone. And let's see what happens. But I guess I never tried to get anyone to pay me to make something. I guess that's why I've always shied away from like Kickstarter and Patreon. Maybe I'm just afraid that being paid for it will fail. But I know I'm going to make these things anyway, so why does that matter? Another thing I wanted to know about was John's drawing style, because it was definitely that animation look when I looked at his webcomic, Chippy and Lupus. What would you say is the inspiration for the style that you draw? Is it one that you were taught in school? Is it one over a period of working with other people, or is there a specific style? I, I grew up reading Pogo. Um, oh, even yeah. though. It, I, yeah, I'm sorry, I realize that now that you say it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, well, first I have to say I'm 51 years old, so I'm not old enough to have read Pogo while it was in the papers. Like a lot of people, I discovered Pogo, like, for for whatever reason, when I was, when I was like 13, 14, 15, you could walk into any – I'll – I, I just na named my age, so I don't, I'm not dating myself. You walk into any B. Dalton's or Walden books mm -hmm. and walk right over to the humor books, and there'd be Pogo books right next to Garfield. Like, you know, Garfield's up here, Pogo's down here. And uh, so I had a healthy collection of Pogo books at the time. I was so drawn to the way they looked, and I loved the fact that they just kind of walked around through that swamp and mm -hmm. chased each other through that swamp, and that swamp felt so real. Like, during the – during part of the strip he was just kind of doing goofy little character stuff and so that stuff always appealed to me the political stuff just went like right over my head but until i went back and oh i see this is what's going on but i love the way they interacted so there's a lot of if i mean i'm more or less ripping off pogo um <laughs> to a great extent see it's he's an inspiration but i'm not even close to touching it i loved there's a obviously a strong warner brothers cartoon influence there's a friend of mine named chris sanders was a huge influence to me he's he's the guy who directed and he directed lilo and stitch and that's more or less his drawing style oh you can look his stuff up online you can see and you'll see oh yeah john's obviously ripping off chris um <laughs> He's one of the writers and directors of the, of the first How to Train Your Dragon movie, oh, cool. Crudes for the Crudes for um, DreamWorks, and he's now directing live action. But mm. he's an amazing, he's an amazing artist. And then Harvey Kurtzman, oh nice, a, like a huge influence on the, on the way I draw. You can, it's a little less obvious. I only wish I could draw like Harvey yeah. Kurtzman. It's oh, one of those ones. Amazing. It's yeah, it's one of those ones where I'm going to sit down and I'm going to figure this out, and it's like nope. Why am I even trying? <laughs> I have friends who, uh, I, and I have like a bunch of his books. I've got the Hey Look collection that oh, Kitchen awesome. Sink put back, put up. I've got two copies of that. And then there's like weirder kind of more obscure stuff I like. There's a French cartoonist named Simon, and I'm going to butcher his last name, Simon Laturgy, Laturgy. And then the guy, the and I can never remember their names, the guys who did Asterix and Obelix. It's less obvious because those guys draw so well that I cannot even touch <laughs> right. that stuff. John does animation as a job, and I'm in awe of the things he's worked on. So even though he's pitching his webcomic as a series, it did start as a comic, and he kept doing it. So I wondered which one he liked to do more. I love working in animation, but if I could, truthfully, um, my dream is always to be a comic artist. And if I could, if I could make a living doing 
just get have health insurance, all that stuff by just doing a comic strip. That's what I'd be doing. That's not the reality we live in anymore. So I work in animation. I love it. I love collaborating and stuff like that. But man, there's something about doing a strip. Yeah. There's something about drawing comics that I just love. Have you ever thought about what it would take to do it? I mean, I get that you're saying that, yeah, it would take insurance and other sort of benefits that you would have. But I mean, have you ever looked at how you would do that? I mean, just, just even spitballing it, just even entertaining the idea, not saying like, okay, I'm going to sit down and do this. My window to make this particular comic strip successful on that level, even if, if even if I could, I, I'm, I kind of think my comic strip is too, maybe a little too weird for its own good. Um, just, just because I, I constantly, I'm constantly referring back to myself and it's like, it's, it's just, it's a lot, it's very self-referential at times. And it's the type of thing that doesn't, it's, it's not served well by the internet. You know, if you look at trips that are super successful and support their, their creators well are things like Penny Arcade and uh, PVP. If I had hit the ground running with this comic strip at 2005, 2006 and been consistent with it, if I was, if I'd done that back then, maybe, <laughs> but <laughs> I don't know what it would take now because advertising is gone. None of those guys are supported by advertising anymore. It's all yeah. Patreon and Kickstarter. My numbers on when I would they have site, my numbers are always really low. Hmm. That, I, that kind of that was discouraging. It's one of the reasons I stopped doing it, especially when I when I started directing How to Train Your Dragons TV show. That it just wouldn't. This it was too intense a job. I couldn't do it. So that's one of the reasons why I kind of stopped doing it consistently now i guess it, in in this day and age you can you can put up a page i don't think i could live in southern california because i don't think any of those guys make the kind of money you need to yeah you would have to live somewhere more financially yeah. feasible <laughs> yeah i have to yeah <laughs> John is going to start updating his webcomic again, and he told me you can check it out at his website, chippyandlupuscomics.com. This is the last episode for this season of the show, but I will be starting more interviews in the next month or so, so make sure to sign up for the mailing list to find out when I do the next call out for artists to the list. Or just head over to the website and go to americanbandito.com slash subscribe, and you can sign up there, and you can find links to all the other stuff that I'm on. And you'll be able to stay up to date with what's happening on the train car and read my daily comic. I hope to talk to you soon, and until next season, so long.